first, who am I? Uh, so I've been with KDE for a long time. Uh, yeah, did KPDF, which you probably don't know anymore because that's how we used to call it Ocular 20 years ago. Uh, I've been doing translations, release, releases, uh, working KDE games in KDE. Do I was the founding uh, president of KDE Spain. I was part of the KDE board. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything. And the most important part of this slide is that I'm not a security expert, so I'm going to talk to you about something which is security related, but uh, it's just something I've been uh, doing lately. So if you have questions, I might have not have answers for your questions. Uh, so just be aware of it. Right, so uh, which kind of security issues am I going to be talking about, right? So it's going to be mainly related to wrong use of memory, right? So like using unidentified memory or using memory that was already f freed, right? This means the application will either crash because you're doing something with memory that's not yours or that wasn't anymore or whatever, or that will behave unexpectedly because your variable is not initialized and then things happen that you don't expect them to happen, right? Uh, people that are more experienced than me in security uh, say that any memory-related crash can be turned into a code execution exploit, right? I've never seen this happening. I don't have a clue how this happens, but that's one of the mantras there is in the security community, right? If you're crashing because you're using uninitialized memory, that means someone can put code there and make it do things they want and not what you want, right? So it, it's very important to fix this kind of bugs because it can basically be code execution and we don't want to be doing code execution, right? So which tools do we have to, to, to detect that you're doing either wrong memory use or using your memory after it's been freed or whatever, right? So the, the first and very basic tool is the operating system. Your application might crash if you're using the memory wrong, right? It doesn't happen all the time because the, the, the operating system and the C library and whatever, it's sometimes a bit too lazy doing things and it will give you more memory than you need. And then if you use that memory, that's, it's not really yours, but the operating system gave it to you because whatever, it will not crash, but yeah, so yeah. Then we have Balgrind, right? So Balgrind will find us, will help us find these kind of memory errors. The problem with Balgrind is that it will take 10 days to run uh, your application if it's a bit complicated, right? I've, I've tried that with, with Ocular and PDF parsing sometimes, and, and I got bored after a day of having it running on my computer, right? It's, it, for some things that are very long, it's just not feasible to do. And then one of the modern tools, which is similar to, but Valgrind does, but it's just so much faster, is the uh, compiler sanitizer, right? So that's something that as far as I understand, Google has been working on, and there's the other sanitizer, the memory sanitizer, and the undefined behavior sanitizer. And basically what they do is they add code to your application that checks for all the things that can go wrong, uh, but since it's inside your code, it's much faster than Valgrind. Valgrind pretends to be a virtual CPU kind of thing, so everything is so much slower because things don't, like they are intercepted by Valgrind, right? So that's one of the things that makes uh, the memory sanitizer, like the compiler sanitizer, sorry, uh, much faster. It's also a bit harder to use because you actually have to link to them and you, know, you need to know how to do that, right? Valgrind can just run your binary. But let's assume you know how to do that. So what is fuzzing? Uh, it's it's uh, a technique in which you basically send garbage to your application and try to make it crash or not crash, right? Uh, so that way you make sure that whatever the input is, your application will not crash. So one could do fuzzing by hand, right? You could just start with PDF info, for example, which is a binary that will, if you give it a PDF, it will tell you the title and the author and whatnot, and you could use starting echo A, echo B, echo C, and D, and E, and just like try all the possible 
input, right? That this is very basic. Nobody does that, but it's one of the ways you could do it, right? It's just like do a for loop forever and just send it random shit and, and see if it crashes. So what is OSFUS? OSFUS is the, the main uh, topic of this, of this talk. OSFUS is a, is a fuzzing engine developed by Google. Uh, actually, the fuzzing engine is not called OSFUS. It's called Lif Lifvuser, but OSFUS is like the bigger term they're using everywhere. So, so I'm using that too. So basically, it's, it's a very, very smart fuzzing tool, right? It's coverage-based which means it knows, it understands your code and will minimize the randomness of fuzzing, right? So if you have a function where there's an integer that has an x and then you check for x being bigger or smaller than 50, it will not try 51, 52, and 53, right? Because like, it knows that 51, 52, and 53, it's just this, it will execute the same code. So why try it, all those, right? So it is really, really advanced. I don't know how they actually do that, because uh, when I think how to do it, I don't have no idea how would I do it, but, but they do, and, it, and it, it works. I mean, it's really amazing. So what is OSFUS number two? Uh, so the problem with, for example, the sanitizers and Clang that, and whatever is that you really need the latest version because they are constantly improving. So sometimes if you want to run this in your distribution, it will either not work or it will be hard to set up or, or stuff like that, right? So they basically have a set of Docker images which are updated to the latest uh, everything, right? So this way you just run, uh, download the Docker images, run a command, and it will start fuzzing the project. And it's like, almost effortless, right? It's like, uh, so at this point, there are like 240 projects in the OSFUS uh, GitHub repo, if we can see them here. So yeah, there's like lots of things, right? Like there's BC, there's uh, ClamUp, the antivirus thingy, there's Curl, David, which is like the new uh, video stuff. Uh, there's FFMP, MPEG, there's File, there's Firefox, FreeType, GhostScript, like lots of lots of projects are, are in OS, OSFUS. What is OSFUS number three? Uh, it's also a, a software as a service thing, right? So they have, uh, Google has lots of servers, right? So they basically give you a thing that will run everything for you, right? So it will get the Docker images that you created, uh, run them for a while, find the bug, tell you if you found the bug, right? They are very strict on the bug policy. So uh, when it finds a bug, it will send you an email saying, I found the bug. This is the uh, bug trace and the file you can use to reproduce it and whatnot. You have 30 days to fix it. If you don't fix it in 30 days, they will make the issue public, right? Uh, some people say that's very extreme, but I mean, it's a way to force people to just get their ass and, and fix things, right? The good thing about this is that all the software needed to run this thing is free software. So if you really wanted to do that in your project because you're crazy, you could do it. Uh, you will need lots of processing power, right? I mean, like doing fuzzing basically means running software for a long time. So I mean, if Google is doing it for free, why would you not let them do it, right? And that's what's OSS Foos number four, right? So basically, that's uh, uh, an image they have on, on their web. So how it works is that you write a fuzzer. We'll see uh, some example fuzzers I've written for KD stuff uh, recently. It's not very hard, at least the ones I wrote. I guess you could go into more detail. You write a fuzzer. Uh, you commit, it builds in Jenkins, blah, blah, blah. It finds bugs there, and it tells you, right? So it's, it's basically that. It's like they, they run the fuzzer itself. They put it uh, on, well, lots of people. You're all late. Uh, you put it on the, on the web, run for a while. 
tell you, and then you have 30 days to fix it. Right. So uh, what do we have in KDE and OSS FAS? Right. We are actually running OSS FAS for uh, K image formats since January, for K codecs since February, and K archives since April. Uh, kind of health related to KDE, we are also fuzzing uh, Poplar, which is the PDF uh, library we use since May last year, and libical, which is for the uh, calendaring stuff since April. What all these have in common uh, is that they may they will be probably used without you having without you wanting to use them, right? The, the, the typical example is K image formats, right? Somebody will send you an email with an image and it will run code because you will preview the image in, in, in K mail and, and if you have a bug there, it will crash K mail just because somebody sent you uh, an image with a malformed, uh, an email with a malformed image, right? So the, the idea here is that we have to be very, very, cautious about things that run without the user even pressing any button, right? So uh, I'm going to uh, show you now how the K archive, oh, I left something in Spanish there. I give this tag in Spanish first, so there's like one line in Spanish, whatever. Uh, do you see this? It's, it's big enough, right? I guess. Right, so this is uh, what we have uh, in the OSS Fast GitHub for K archive. Uh, it's very easy. Let me open uh, the few files. Right. So uh, first, the Docker file. It's relatively easy. Uh, we have to check out everything we need, right? So we get libzip. Uh, sorry, zlib, libzip, bzip, uh, exit lib, and then we get Qt. ECM and KRCAF itself, right? That, that's the things we need to, to be able to fast uh, KRCAF itself. Then we build it, right? It's not very hard. I mean, you have to build everything, but it's like configure make, configure make, uh, configure make, configure make. Qt is a bit harder. Yeah, Qt is, doesn't like, uh, so I, I, I do some shit there from Qt, but like ignore Qt uh, for KRCAF with the C make, make, and, and that's it, right? It's, it's, it's not, the rocket science, and then the uh, faster itself. So how it works, if you have to write, you have to write a function whose sorry, input is basically a, a, a byte array, right? So it's a, a car pointer and a size. So what we do there is basically I create all the possible archive files that character could be, right? So 7-zip, tar, tar with gzip, tar with bzip, tar with exit, zip and, and r, and I just like run all those codes, right? And this found quite a few things, right? If we go to the uh, k archive log, k archive log, right? So you see my name is here. Don't desert, don't desert, don't desert, don't crash, blah, 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 right? So it found a few things. Yeah, more here. Yeah. Unidentalized memory, memory leak, in bad memory, right? So uh, K archive, which I'm sure it's something that people have looked at the code very closely and it was written carefully, uh, still had a few bugs, right? Uh, one of the random bugs we found, uh, which is kind of interesting, let me find it here, is uh, K archive and very long file paths, right? So K archive has a recursive function in which it will try to, if you give it a path, it will try to find to which uh, folder it belongs, right? So it will go up, 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 trying to find the folder it belongs. Uh, if you get a path which is longer than for like 5,000 characters, and basically being a b a slash a slash a slash right, so it's like very short name directory names and just 
one inside the other, this thing will recurs too much. It will end up uh, exhausting your your stack, right? So basically, the 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 stack will just grow too much and it will crash. So we did a very poor man solution, which is just not don't recurs too much, which in this case it should work because I found out that only like even with a small uh, stack, it will crash after 2,500 recursions, which is like a very long path. So I, I think like Linux actually doesn't let you have a, long, a path that long between like the path max is 4,000 characters. So you, if you, even if you do like one uh, directories of one character, you still need another one for the slash. So that should be fine, hopefully. Otherwise, somebody has to rewrite this to not be recursive, right? which is a pain in the ass. Let's not do that. So yeah, so that was k-archive. Uh, k-image formats is basically the same. Uh, if you see the fuzzer, yep, low. It's the same thing. You get the data, you create, you create an image, you, you read it, right? It's, it's, not, it's nothing very complicated. So, yeah, sorry, I, yeah. Uh, we found lots of bugs in our uh, image formats, which are like the very random thingies we have. So if you, if you look at our image formats, we have uh, readers for things like RAS and RGB and TGA, and that's the GIMP thingy, but we only support a very old GIMP format. So, yeah, it's not very useful, right? But if you look at the log, yeah, I, I did fix lots of bugs here, right? Uh, it, it, it goes after the first page, and, and then I think a bit more. Yeah. So, basically, we were, like, we were vulnerable to people sending us random images and crashing everything, right? Actually, that started because somebody uh, sent an email to security at KD.org saying, I have this image that crashes uh, everything. And then I started running OSS Foos. And we're like, yep, there's a few more images that crash everything. What's even more interesting is that it found issues in the PNG handler, right? So what we're fuzzing there uh, for our we're only fuzzing our own code, right? So we are, we're only sending, like, the inputs we have is a GIMP file or a RGB file or whatever. But since it's coverage-based and it also saw that it could end up in, in the PNG, it was able to morph the file enough so it ended up inside the, the PNG file handler inside it queued itself, right? And it found that in lots of cases, this was being used in an unitalized uh, manner which is bad, right? But that shows how powerful the thing is that you start giving it a GIMP file and it will morph the GIMP file to be something the PNG handler half of understands and, and then fails reading it, right? So it is really, really, really very, very powerful. So uh, future work, we should fast more things. Right? We have more things in, in KDE that are run automatically, right? Baloo is, is one of the, like, you put a file in your, in, in your file system and Baloo will go there and like, we'll do all random shit on it, right? That has to be made sure it won't crash, right? Because, yeah, that's not good. Same thing for K-file metadata. More things PIM related, like I'm pretty sure that when you get an email, lots of things happen inside PIM that we should make sure are not crashing. Uh, yeah, the problem is somebody needs to work on that, right? Uh, it's not very difficult, as I showed you, but only, like, it's very easy to do if your input is a byte array, right? If your input is a byte array, that's easy. Like, you can plug it in the function, and it will be trivial. If your input is something else, well, there's, mo there's more work that, that needs to be done, right? Uh, yep, and that's my talk. We have some time for questions, I think. Elio has a question here. Thank you. So considering that it's not that heavy 
running this filter and you need to run anyway, it's not possible to actually add in this in the unit tests. So at the point that every function that it tests and it passed the filter, so we already have in the uh, incompletely built system, you can guarantee that all the frameworks by default been tested. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Yeah, so that's, it's not possible to put in this in unit tests by default. So, well, it's it it is. I mean, it will. It needs to run for hours sometimes to find a bug, right? So that you can't really. I mean, you could add unit tests for every single crash you found. That's something we could do. That's something David wanted me to do for uh, K Archive, and I didn't do it because there's like twenty or thirty files that make it crash, right? So it's like. And the thing, and this thing just still runs every day. So it, it, if you regress, it will find it, right? I mean, it will take a while. It will not be part of a unit test. We could put it as unit type. We could put unit tests for all the cases we found, so to make sure we don't regress. We haven't been doing that for now. But I mean, David wanted to do that, so I could be convinced otherwise. Any more questions? Ooh. Almost. I was going to say thank you, but <laughs> I waited half a minute, uh, half a second more. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and unfortunately, I missed the beginning of your talk. Um, do I understand correctly that you you add this code to some Google repository and they run the stuff? Yeah. Right. So all you have to do is provide yeah. the code, and they you you only run the code, you upload it, they will run it every day for a while, for a bit, and they they keep the they keep the state, right? So like tomorrow they don't test the same, they just continue, so yeah. And you get notifications whenever they yeah, find something? Yeah, you get something. email, yeah. You get emails and something. Because uh, it, it, it's related to that question, how do we ensure no regressions in the long run? So right. I'm wondering if um, we can treat it as CI, as in, in two years, if we reintroduce the bug, they will find it. Right. Through the magic of randomness, right? right? So they have to somehow try the same file again. <laughs> right, right, right. So there is so uh, the public bugs you can see them. There's there's uh, there's a bug tracker somewhere. Uh, I don't have a link here. Anyway, there's like the so the, when it finds a bug, it will give you 30 days to fix it, and if you don't fix it, it will be public. So the public bugs you can go to a web page. It's a bug tracker, and it's like everything. This this is everything public. Okay. And uh, the ones that you fix, I think, are also public. So it. One of the things we could do is go here, make sure there is no, like as part of a release process, go here, make sure there's nothing new. Uh, we can also add more people to the emails that I re received. Like at the moment, only uh, I receive the emails. The problem, the only, the, the only problem, it needs to be a Google email, email. It's a bit meh for that. I like the idea of having to check a web page before releasing. I, I do check already CI and a few other right. things. I could check the first thing. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. You'll send me links. Yeah. I'll look into it. And there was also a question back there. Do you have some sort of stats, some kind of hall of fame or hall of shame? <laughs> How how do KDE libraries compare to other open source projects in terms of um, right. number of issues or like code coverage, things like that? I don't. Th I mean, you can see the code coverage, but no, actually you can't. So you can only see the code coverage for your own projects. So I can see the code coverage for. K image formats, right? But I can't see it for Firefox. So they don't have this kind of gamification thing in which you can do. Okay? I don't see it. It must be somewhere else. I don't know where it is. I've seen it directly as Google. Right. Maybe they do have it internally, but I'm not sure if that's public. Or if it is, I will be interested to know where it is. I, I don't know where it is. Question here? Hi, so I, I came late to a talk, so maybe you already talked about it. Sure. But it, the fuzzing, is it just a stream of random bytes that come no. in? So it, it is, uh, it, it's it's a very smart thingy, and it will, it's basically coverage based, so it, it 
gives it a random a random number, right? And then it flips one bit, and then it tries to see which variable changed because you flipped that bit. And then if you have something like uh, this, right? And also, it, only it, knew, it knows that the only interesting values for x are 49 and 50, right? Because like it's the two values that will run the both branches. So it will, it's not, I mean, it's random at the beginning, but then it learns about which bit influences each variable, and it will not be random. I mean, it's half random. It, it, it's smart, let's put it this way. And can you also kind of define what kind of inputs come in? So for example, if you have a HTML parser, you don't want random bytes coming in because, right. but you do want a random yes. valid HTML. There is a way to give it a dictionary of kind of like, those are the keywords that you should be flipping or, or working on, right? Like uh, you can give him some direction. I, I really haven't done that, but I know you can kind of instruct him what to focus on. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? No? Okay, thank you, Albert. Yep, thank you.